Welcome to the future of education. And now here's your host, Michael Horn. Welcome to the future of education, where we are obsessed about helping all individuals build their passions and fulfill their human potential. Now, I've long said that if we're serious about helping all individuals do just that, then we need to help them not just with their academics, but also focus on their health and wellness and their habits of success. And a big part of that can and should be built on a foundation of fitness, which means instilling lifelong habits of fitness when they're in K through 12 schools. But that means some big changes in how we think about sports, PE, and more in our society. So to help us think about this topic and frankly, the broader topic of preparing students to lead successful lives, we have two incredible guests today. First, we have a first on this uh, show. We have an Olympic gold medalist uh, in Steve Messler. He won gold in the 2010 Olympics in the four-man bobsled, but he also currently serves as the co-founder and CEO of Classroom Champions, which offers an award-winning social-emotional learning curriculum in K-8 schools. We also have my friend Andy Rotherham joining us today. Andy, of course, has been a national leader in the world of education reform, and he has served in a variety of roles really as a bridge across the various partisan bickering and silos. He's the co-founder of Bellwether, which works to transform education systems to ensure systemically marginalized young people achieve outcomes that lead to fulfilling lives and flourishing communities. He writes the Eduwonk blog, has been a columnist for time, and serves on the Virginia Board of Education. You get the idea, two big deals here today. And with that, Andy, Steve, thank you so much for joining me. It's uh, great to see you both. Great to be here. This is going to be fun. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you bet. So I I just want to dive in with a macro question for you both, really to set the table, which is in both of your views, why are sports important to young people today? Andy, why don't you go first and then Steve, you can jump in after. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a there's a couple of reasons. I say there's like three, starting with like a basic one. Like it's fun. Sport sport sports are fun. They're fun for they're fun for kids. They're fun for us to to watch. They they bring a lot. But more importantly, there's a couple of really important uh, things that happen with sports. One, we know kids who participate in sports, and it's particularly true of girls. And I I have daughters uh, who participate in sports have better outcomes. And some of that is obviously just the math. If you're spending time doing sports, that's time you're not spending doing other things. So it makes sense that you some some of the sort of behaviors we think about as being more at risk behaviors, you, you'd you'd be less exposed to those just because of time. But even accounting for that, there are other things that lead to really good uh, really good externalities and outcomes. Um, And I don't think it's surprising you see, particularly, again, among women, women who participated in sports, uh, achieving elsewhere uh, in their lives at a very high level. And I think that's because that third thing, it gives you the ability to learn how to win, how to lose, how to communicate, how to work together, all kinds of skills that are just really important uh, out there in the workplace and in life. Uh, And it, it lets you get them in a very authentic way. It's not contrived. It's not made up. You're learning those things. Um, through, through real lessons. I mean, that's part of, you know, I'm on Steve's board at, at Classroom Champions, not, and we don't want to spend the whole time talking about that. But like, as I segue to Steve on this question, that is part of like what we do at Classroom Champions is sort of letting students see this happening in authentic ways with their mentors, not contrived ways and made up, but in very real ways, see, see these kinds of things and learn from them. Well, Steve, what would, what, what would you Yeah, add? I mean, well, first of all, wait a minute, we're not talking about Classroom Champions the entire time here? Why, why would you start up most? most um, uh, no, debate, right, debate and switch. Right. I mean, no, I mean it's it's an incredibly important question, Michael. And I mean, I I think it honestly it leans back to your opening, which was thinking about how to help kids have a life that not only provides them academic opportunity, which then we know is how um, whether you're looking to break the cycle of poverty, whether you're just looking to get ahead of life or just do bigger things, it, you know, it really begins with academics. But I think the realization that it doesn't begin and end with academics is, is where sport comes into play. Cause ultimately like, what else are we all doing here? What else are we all doing here? But to live rewarding lives that, you know, we can live longer. Uh, we can live happier. We can be healthy. We can think longer. We can do all these things. And, and um, you know, again, whether you're talking about uh, trying to help kids, um, you know, whether it is in some of the communities that Classroom Champion serves in, in Camden, New Jersey, or in you know, rural Indiana, or whether you're talking about, um, you know, those on the, maybe on the haves side, um, you know, of the, 
of the American economy. Uh, ultimately, I, I think sport is this like demonstrable place for kids to see. Just like Andy said, I mean, I'm going to echo something that Andy said, but ultimately it's it's demonstrable. Kids can see it happening, whether they're experiencing it themselves or not. And they're participating. Look, sports isn't for everybody. I'm I'm OK with saying that I'm comfortable with saying that. But the principles that sport teaches are for everybody. And when kids can see winning and losing happening, whether again on the field themselves or in others or in their role models, uh, you know, athletes still, still to this day, you know, right there with YouTube stars and TikTok stars, athletes are those people. They are the only consistent role models as we've, you know, kind of transitioned from a, uh, you know, a generation that be participates and watches things on television to now can find their own role models as they please on the internet. And those role models are getting thrown at, thrown in their faces in a way that you know wasn't there when we were kids sport serves a purpose because again it's the rules are clear it's an opportunity to follow agree to rules uh, and we have to remember look I spent eight years on the board of directors of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee and if there's one thing that I really took away from that it's all made up it's all made up we all decided the line in football is out and the line in tennis is in. Those are arbitrary things, but so are majority of the laws and so are the majority of the, the things that we do in life. And I think sport is this like wonderful place where life kind of just mirrors there, where we've all agreed to a set of rules. We're going to follow them. The moment somebody doesn't follow them, they either get thrown in a penalty box and they have to sit on the sidelines and be singled out in front of 20,000 people. You know, in the NHL, you're sitting in a box just by yourself because you messed up. Um, and it, it reflects on that. So I think that's where from a societal standpoint for sport, that's what I like really see the value on. And again, uh, you know, Andy, I think did a great job talking about those things that go into the sport world. No, that makes sense. And Charles Barkley, I, I suppose, be damned in, in terms of the role model comment. But the uh, I'm curious sort of how we're doing on that, right, in terms of schools and society more broadly, because this frankly doesn't have to all be on the backs of schools, but really the opportunities for the kids that want to choose. And I take your point, not everyone's going to want to do sports. But for those kids that do want to participate, how are we doing in creating those opportunities in your view and, and, and sort of what are we doing right and wrong? Yeah, no, I mean, look, there, I mean, there's data behind this. Like there could be my there's my opinion, but then there's actually what the data says in this world. Um, and, you know, the fact of the matter is that over the last like 13 world, 13 or so years ago, our friends over at Project Play at the Aspen Institute, Tom Ferry and, and uh, you know, Jennifer's amazing shop over there, like their data is pretty clear. I mean. Participation is down from 45% in 2008 to I think 37% uh, in 2021. That's a pretty material. That's a pretty material drop. Um, and and then you know over half of the kids that are participating, 58% of the kids that are participating, are doing so through their like community based programming. So where are kids coming? Those community based things. Um, I live up in Calgary, Canada. I moved here to train when I was bobsledding. I was two feet wider, two feet taller back in my bobsled days. And I moved up here to train and, um, you know, and our you know daughter can participate in community sport right here. Same thing happens all over America. So I think, how are we doing? Um, we're losing, we're losing them. Um, but I think in that turn, we can maybe also see the value and what it is that we're losing. And I think, uh, you know, the only way to turn things around is people have to see what we're losing and see what the problems are. And I think this is going to be a pretty... Um, pretty stark one outside of the, the the concept that you know, look, when all of us were in school, physical act, phys, you know, phys ed was a much more prominent part of our days. Uh, and I think the transition from you know when I went to school from the eighties and nineties, you could see phys ed activity, daily activity, drop from something that was a relatively daily occurrence to a once in every five or six day um, allotment. And uh, two generations later, we are in a mental health crisis. Uh, those things are not not connected. Um, we've increased screen time and we've decreased physical activity and we've decreased the mandate of that in our schools. To your point, it doesn't have to happen in schools, but hey, look, basically 100% of kids are in schools. So I guess I look at it a little different. That was interesting. And, and we didn't like, we didn't rehearse this. And so like, that was interesting to hear from Steve because I, I look at it a little bit differently. I don't think we're doing great. And there's some, I mean, look, the, you know, Steve mentioned the Aspen work and 
they are doing just fantastic work on this. I encourage everybody to check it out. One of the things in a recent study they put out, it's almost nine hundred dollars a year people were paying out of pocket for sports. So that right there, that's going to be un- inaccessible for a lot of people. And I think that's actually a low number if you know kids. Did I say it wrong? Did I say it wrong? it's dropped? Yeah, you yeah, know it's dropped. But like, okay, all right. You know, like it's still <laughs> happening around the country. I worry that we're actually de-emphasizing rec sports in favor of competitive sports. And so, for example, Chili Davis, the baseball player, he's talked about how it's become so specialized. He's not sure he would have been a baseball player now. And you're sort of you're seeing this in, in like a number of sports. I remember like with my with my girls, um, a, a parent, well-intentioned parent with with older kids took us aside um uh when they were playing soccer and was like hey if you're really serious about them succeeding in soccer at a high level playing playing varsity be able to play really competitive travel like here are the kinds of things you need to be doing with them now clinics labs specialized coaching my girls were seven at the time right yeah. and we were like i don't know if they how much they like like soccer and they've both been very successful in sports but neither of them actually in soccer they found their way to other sports and and so that I what I worry about Michael a lot is we're losing that emphasis on sort of sports for fun, sports for rec. Kids stop playing when the funnel gets more narrow, and so if they're not making varsity, they're like and, and they're on track for that. They stop playing if they're not. You know, JV, you see that funnel, and you know I don't want to romanticize it, but like if you spend time in Europe, I'm always struck even when you just talk to people in a lot of European countries. They don't ask you, do you play sports? They ask you, do you do sport? What sport do you do? And that's not just like a contrivance of language. It's 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 a different thing. We think of play and competition and so forth. They think of doing as moving and doing those things and being active. And I think there's a reason you see many more in Europe, many more people playing sports much later into their lives um, than you see here. And so to Steve's point earlier about like the important health outcomes and so forth, we should want to get as many kids as possible playing. So we'll have as many adults as possible still moving and doing things. And I just don't think we're doing a great job. And one thing maybe we can talk about here is like that relationship, school sports, community sports, do we need to be rethinking that just as a basic access, equity, inclusion kind of question? Yeah, no, and I think, and sorry, Mike, I'll, I'll hop in because I think Andy is, again, having lived in a foreign country for 20 years now, and yet Classroom Champions works across the U.S. system and across the Canadian system, I have this really interesting opportunity to, to look at both sides. And then again, being part of the, the the U.S. pipeline, I did Junior Olympics from 10 or 11 years old. I got an NCAA scholarship, and then I went to three Olympics. So, I, I, And then I said, you know, Founded class and sit on the board. So I've had, I've had, I personally have had the entire life cycle of doing multiple sports as a youth, excelling in one that I found after my first, you know, f- first sport, and then moving through the entire system, um, and then and then wind up overseeing the system in that way. And I think that there's one thing that the U.S. has a completely different viewpoint of than the rest of the world, and that is to what Andy said. There is our viewpoint of the value of sport. Uh, it is intuitive in Canada that sport for young people is good. It's intuitive in Europe that sport for young people is good. In America, it's, uh, eh, well, I don't want my, you know, they're going to try to go to the NFL or they're trying to go to the NBA. Um, we have this viewpoint that participation in sport has an end goal, which is success at these higher levels in a lot of ways. And it's permeated through and kind of corrupted the, to Andy's point, they're trying to get him at seven years old. They're trying to get him into clinics and all these things because Andy's goal must be to get them a college, college scholarship. That must be the goal if he's having his seven-year-old participate in sports. And I see it now. I've got a five on the other end of Andy. In some ways, I've got a five and a half-year-old and a you know an almost one-year-old. So I'm thinking about these things, thinking about these things a lot. It is you know how do you change that? I don't know. You, I don't know if you could think about changing the culture in America on that one. Um, but how can we ch- we change? And I think that's where schools do come into play because you do have uh, systemic opportunities there that you can influence in that way. Well, and that sort of gets where my head goes, right? Which is, so I've got eight-year-old girls. They're super into gymnastics. I can see the funnel already starting, right? And uh, and, and it's, frankly, it's kind of crazy from what I've read about the research around not trying to specialize. Um, and then to your point, we sort of have this PE, which frankly, I was in Montgomery County growing up. They had already moved PE to once a week, I think, back in, in the 1980s. Uh, but you sort of see this steady decline of a focus on participation and movement and that just, you know, be, be active. Right. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm, I'm in terms of this participation conversation, two of the books that I've read that have really influenced my thinking 
over the past decade are both by David Epstein and Steve. You, you reminded me that you're in one of them, uh, the sport gene uh, and, and range, of course. And one of my takeaways from, from the research there was even for those that do want to star in that sport or want that college scholarship because this is their quote unquote way in or whatever else it is, uh, frankly, maybe even especially for those individuals, that they ought to play lots of different sports and not specialize too early. And, you know, he has this great, David sent this great newsletter out about this moment with Serena Williams in the front row where he's presenting the research and being like, well, she was the consummate tennis player from early on. And she was like, no, you're right. Like I learned to throw a football. Like I did all these other activities. And to your point, Steve, I mean, your own personal journey, I, I think you were a decathlete in college for the Florida Gators. Uh, so you obviously were doing a lot of different things. How do we get that narrative out there? Maybe, maybe that's the question. Like, how do we change the narrative? So people recognize just doing is a really important thing right now in a lot of different fields. And then we'll let the chips sort of fall where they may maybe over time, but not have that immediate like transactional obsession up front. I, I mean, I think it's a great question, Andy. I mean, what do you think from a, from a school's, I mean, or from a community communication standpoint? Well, I'm just struck the thing I thought you were, I'm struck when you talk to people who have succeeded at a high level and, and with one of the th things with my work is you sometimes get to interact with folks who have succeeded in, you know, professional in, in, in baseball or in hockey or whatever. And one of the things they uniformly are like, don't specialize young, do different. It's, it's like, it, it's, it's a, it, this idea that you have to specialize is almost like a bias of people who didn't succeed at a high level. I remember I did a session last year at the bar conference with Nicole Hensley, who's the goalie for the women's Olympic hockey team and Kelly panic who's a forward. And uh, this, this issue came up and I, remember, I think it was Kelly panic. who was just like, you know, your kids should play any sport that's going to make them happy in high school, because if they're good enough to go at that sort of D1 and highly competitive level, they're going to be good enough, whether they're playing two sports or one sports, this idea that you need to like focus them and, and specialize if they're that if they're at that level of, of, of being an athlete, which, again, most kids aren't. So one of the big things is helping people understand, like these funnels are incredibly narrow and everybody thinks, you know, what, what you know, the most important thing you should make sure is happening is that your kid is having fun. They're enjoying moving. They're creating lifelong uh, lifelong relationships with sports and physical activity because the odds of them competing at that level are extremely uh, slim and, and even slimmer uh, after that. And so you just see that again and again. Somebody I don't know, um, but know of, Justin Williams, uh, former NHL player with the Caps, the Canes, the Kings. He's won the Stanley Cup. He runs a hockey camp, very regarded hockey camp up in Canada. And every day he has the kids doing a different sport, just exposing them to him. So one day you're going to learn about these different uh, you know, different sports besides hockey. And it's a hockey camp. And I think a lot of people think you're going to a hockey camp run by somebody like that. It's going to be hockey 24 seven, but he's really into this idea, learn to do other stuff. And I just think as a parent, and I know Steve's experiencing this, you got to expose your kids to lots of stuff. Cause how do you know, how are they going to find out what they like or don't like if all you do is one sport, your kid might be a great tennis player and they're never going to, they're never going to discover that passion that they, that that's actually what they love, not, you know, whatever sport you have them doing. So I think it's, I think it's a little bit, um, it would be helpful if more people in those positions kind of communicate that, that they didn't necessarily get where they got because they just did one thing again and again. They did sort of do different things. They followed some of the stuff that, that, that uh, David talks about in those books. Steve, what's your take? I, I, I mean, I'm of two minds on this one. Uh, and look, we talked about the sport pipeline. We, we talked yeah. about the sport pipeline a he lot. He needs to take a break in a second to, to take his kids, to untape their hand, their uh, right hands from behind their back. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> all, of your, all of those things. All of those things. Um, and uh, I'm of two minds. We talked about the sport pipeline a lot, a lot at the Olympic Committee, Olympic and Paralympic Committee for sure. But ultimately, I'm, I'm here and there. Like, look, I'm 44, which means my story of how I became successful in my day, there wasn't a hyper sports specialization. So I can't necessarily tell you that your kid can do what I did if they take my path because the people they weren't competing against weren't hyper specialized. If I had to hyper specialize against kids in other sports and I wasn't hyper specialized and they were, would my physical attributes be able to overcome? I, I'm definitely of the of the of the mindset, which is, look, if your kid, kid is good enough to get a college scholarship, they're probably going to have a really good opportunity, whether you specialize them or not. It's the ones that are on the fringes, right? It's the it's hedging your bets. It's you know, it's the ones who maybe 
Um, look, my, my kid is always going to have to go against, and she, I'm seeing it already in the ski hill. Yeah, she did good, but her dad was an Olympic gold medalist. So she already has this, like, it's, it's this, you know, thing that she can't help that she can't control that she has like theoretically good genetics, um, for sport in that way. I mean, my sister got the brains in our family. So, um, uh, but I, and I, so I think that's the thing is there's this generational emphasis. I can't tell you. I can't tell you in a hyper-specialized world whether a generalized approach to sport success is going to work today. And, and that's where, and I love range. Look, I was a decathlete. I, I lead my organization with a decathlete mindset. You know, that's the thing is if your kid is, I don't know, like if they're, if they're in a hyper-skill sport and you don't have necessarily the, the, the jumps and the, and the speed to them, is that going to help them? Probably. Do I think that is what is best for kids overall? Absolutely not. Do I think that is what is best from a sport participation standpoint? Absolutely not. But but it's I, I do have I do take exception. What does that mean? You might be right. I'm not I'm not disputing the point because you may well be right that like the level of specialization means everybody has to. But from an equity standpoint, that's a pretty daunting. If that's true, because the costs of these things, like you know, even just the camp I mentioned a minute ago, all this stuff is is staggering and just out of reach for a lot of parents. And so. Like, and you, you know, different sports have different challenges around sort of inclusion and diversity. That's if you're, if you're right, we need to rethink how we're sort of creating those opportunities at the municipal and school level, um, or we're never going to have a level playing field. No, I agree. I mean, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Like, yes, there are sports like track and field. There's some other, um, you know, let's call them pure, like, you know, you, you know, you're fast. Yes. You can get a little bit faster, but you're fast. Um, I was the kid, yeah. fast kid on the soccer team. That's how my dad got me into track. But, you know, I think Andy, maybe one of the answers has to be, we have to think about, I don't know if we can change the momentum of this. What are you going to do? Tell coaches, private coaches to make less money and try to do that. I think the horse is out of the barn on this one. It's really hard to put it back in. If I'm a parent and I, and I have the opportunity to give my child more training and more coaching and, and pay for better things. Who, who as a parent, isn't going to try to do that? Um, in, in a lot of standpoints, I, I'm, you know, I'm again, 50, 50 on how that is actually good for my child's development. When you talk about Europe, Europe has this overwhelming gymnastics base to their physical education programs. Europeans dominate Americans in general, up until the junior ranks. What happens at the junior ranks that U19 rank right after that, our NCAA system kicks in. So they have a they have a, a wonderful foundation in gymnastics. Our kids do gymnastics, hundred percent. That was during the pandemic was painful. We have a tall, gangly five and a half year old. So I really wanted her gymnastics, and she missed a year, year and a half with that up here for sure. But they have the gymnastics base, and then our demographics as well as our NCAA system kind of take over once that gymnastics route leave, you know, gymnastics foundation leaves, and slightly better coaching at the at the youth age group level. Um, but then ultimately on the other side of it just becomes, maybe we need to think about where we invest differently. Do we need to think about our philanthropy or our investments going towards programs like in Canada, I have this something called kids sport, which pays for the fees for kids yeah, yeah. to compete. And I think that yeah. may be a more direct injection, better angle than trying to change the system and the mentality that is hyper American competitiveness, which, you know, benefits our society in a lot of ways, but from a haves and have nots, it clearly isn't. Well, you definitely can't bottle it up. And we, we, we we're seeing out in the broader political landscape what happens when you try to achieve equity by bottling up opportunity. People don't like that, obviously. And you can't tell the coaches in a you know market economy to, to charge less. I think it's that third thing you just talked about. It reminds me a lot of like the SAT. Like people are always going to give, you know, the affluent are always going to give their kids support on the SAT. We knew this. And so the strategy wasn't to sort of, you know, attack them or try to get them to stop doing it. It was how do we start to have good SAT prep available for all kids to try to level? You're never going to, you know, you're never going to completely level the playing field. That's that's life in a, in a liberal democracy. But you can you can definitely shrink those gaps substantially. And that was, you know, I think the same thing here. How do you how do you provide those kinds of those kinds of skill? And just from the beginning, those kinds of exposure again, so kids see sports that they may not be aware of. Their, their families may not be aware of just to make sure they're aware of the just the broad range of things that you can do. Well, and that strikes me as where schools can play a role, right? In PE is to have a more gymnastic foundation and more exploratory, you know, with regularity of getting to sample lots of sports. So to your point, it's almost like a nudge as opposed to a thou shalt stop this behavior sort of attitude. Um, 
as well as having these more equitable leagues that where fees are paid for or, 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 or covered for those who can't. Um, I guess the question is, how do we start to move that in schools? Because, you know, you know this, Andy, like reading and math has crowded out, you know, social studies and science for, for goodness sake in elementary school, which turns out to be critical for reading. But, for you know, forget about that for a moment. Uh, because we're so sort of hyper concerned about some of these things. How, how do we reverse these? Yeah, well, this is a classic, like, look, this is like schools have low capacity to react to these challenges. People crowded out, you know, other subjects. But you, if you're going to teach reading, what exactly are the kids reading? That is how you should be teaching social studies. It's part of how you should be teaching science. But so like the, the, the curriculum narrowing to the extent it happened was like the wrong way to actually, if you were serious about wanting to raise your test scores, it was the wrong way to, to do it in the first place. I think it's the same thing here. We know kids need to move around more than they do. And American kids move around less. It's good for them to be outside. It's good for them to be taking breaks. And we sort of limit those. I mean, we saw a lot of places where they take away your ability to move around as a punishment. So if, if you act up, you lose the ability to go out for recess. When in fact, the reason you're acting up may be because you, you need to be out there doing some of the stuff you do during during recess. So I think it's I think it's it's achievable, Michael. It's one of these things. Schools need to actually look at, at what works. What does the research show? Potentially challenge some some biases that are around sort of some of these things and make sure kids are moving and doing these things. And and again, like you look again in some other countries, kids are just outside much more. They're much more active walking during the school day. These things, these 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 habits and behaviors that, that you want. Um, uh, we just, you know, we, there's just a lot of inertia here and we don't do them. Steve, I want to go to you on this because uh, you, you said you, you want to bring in classroom champions. And is it a conversation about classroom champions? This is the opportunity because uh, and, and, and just to hit a few controversial topics in this. Right. Like social emotional learning is its own hot button issue right now in the United States. Um, you all at classroom champions are saying these are critical life skills for people to be successful, whether it's through sports or otherwise. And you've created this curriculum. I'm curious, just talking about that. Like, how do you define social emotional learning? What does it can, what does it consist of? What isn't included in SEL, and how you approach that? Because you're obviously working with schools to help make sure that they embed this for kids. Yeah. No. I mean, thank you. I, you know, and I think before I even jump into classroom champions, I think it's to talk about the role of sport um, and how do we, how do we, how can we help, not change, but how can we help people lean into it? And I think ultimately, look at classroom champions, we have our countries in the world's best Olympians, Paralympians, NCAA, pro athletes, they are in the midst of their careers, not the gray haired has like me telling my story. And I, I say that both in jest and in reality, which is when you're in the moment of something, you are never more clear of what you need to do to succeed. As I look back, I can say, you know, maybe I didn't need to be so serious. Maybe I didn't need to not have a drink on a Tuesday night randomly. Maybe I needed not, but, but in the moment you couldn't have you couldn't have wavered me for that. I had a drink once every four weeks at the end of the, on a Saturday night at the end of training cycles. There was never a casual Wednesday evening cocktail. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, if we can lean into those attributes and lean into that and look at sport as a cultural phenomenon today, sport is probably, uh, and I'll say this without the data behind me, probably the one thing in our society that got politicized and snapped back in the last five years. Basically, nothing else has. You name me another thing, another piece of our society and culture that got politicized and then isn't just in whichever corner it let it, if it landed on the right or if it landed on the left, it's just stayed there. Sport came back. They stopped kneeling. They did whatever they made. They quote unquote made amends to the people that they were offending on that side. And now, literally, I just saw last week 94 of the top 100 broadcasts in America, the things we watched together. The things you come into work the next day and go, hey, did you see that? It used to be Friends and Seinfeld and Sport and this and that. Now it's 94 broadcasts out of 100 were Sport. And by the way, by the way, one of them was the one that wasn't Sport was also the Academy Awards. Uh, so competition. So when you think about um, the meritocracy, it, it, Sport is, you know, a pure meritocracy. It, it truly is. And when you think about the Americans hunger for that. So there's still a societal need for a societal need for that. And there's places where we need to change those inputs, but ultimately Americans still watch sport because they see they wa they're watching something that has a winner and a loser, and they can watch it happen in front of them. So when it comes to how do we we, we how do we at Custom Champions view SEL, is we view these things as the things that sport brings kids and things that it brings us all, all to watch the inspiration, the hope, 
uh, the stick to itness, the grit, the perseverance, all those things are previously black box skills. That Michael works hard. He's a hard worker. Andy has a lot of grit. No, th these are skills. These are skills that at some point, somebody put a value on that, either the self or somebody else, and then taught them. And then they worked on those skills. But for some reason, it's been this black box where you come out of high school and you come out of college and you come out of kind of post, you know, any postgraduate work, whatever it is. And no one taught you these things explicitly. You are supposed to implicitly learn it. And did you learn those things or not? I don't, I, I couldn't tell you at Classroom Champions, other than some of our hyper education folks, I couldn't tell you exactly what everybody's degrees were, but I can tell you their personality. I could tell you their, you know, how, like what their stick to itness is, their, their conscientiousness, those things. And these, again, their skills. So at Classroom Champions, we view SEL in that way. We view them as, I don't love the word life skills, but they are, it's just too broad. We, we view it as they are skills that do help um, you know, with goal setting, perseverance, critical thinking, decision making, t tenacity, teamwork, they do. You know, our curriculum aligns with Castle's. You know, five basics of SEL: self awareness, self management, social awareness, relationship skills, re responsible decision making. Random, you know, rolling them all off. We align with that, but ultimately, um, how do you help schools use sport as a neutral place, a political place that everybody? Whether you like sports or not, you are fascinated by them um, in general. You are fascinated by the people who do them. How do we use these people as the as a keystone for that and then bring an SEL program around it? And, and that's the way we look at it. And, um, you know, I, I just I I worry that we see sport as this separate thing in society. And I think sport has the opportunity to help build positive culture in so many ways. Um, and we've seen the data on that at Classroom Champions. So uh, I'll, I'll stop myself there. This is, a, this is an area of where SEL, the politics of it all, the way that society still views sport are just like this really, really big flashpoint for us. Andy, I'd love your take on this because obviously Virginia has been no stranger to the debates over this question, but I really like the way Steve just phrased it as sport can cut through that and I don't know parents who don't want their kids to grow up with a sense of perseverance and, you know, a, a mindset of working hard leads to success. And like when we get at that level, I don't know parents that disagree with those sorts of things. So is, is this sort of the way to cut through all this? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would extrapolate from it. I, I don't want Classroom Champions is great, obviously, as I said, I'm on the board. I don't think we're the only way to cut through it. I think the problem and Steve, Steve didn't, you know, you know, talked about the politics. The problem is right now, SEL has become one of these terms. It's impossible to define. Lots of things are flying under that flag. And there has, and we should be honest about it, there's been an effort in some quarters to use SEL as a way to smuggle political ideas into, into classrooms in a way that I think parents are like, wait, that's not what I signed up for. And so I think one of those important things the SEL community needs to do is come up with, and especially the, the particular providers, come up with what they're talking about. I mean, you listen to Steve. Steve can give you a very specific answer when we talk about SEL, the skills and so forth and what, and what, we're, what we're talking about, um, and, and that they need to be willing to stand behind those definitions so we can start to have some clear lines in terms of what is these things around sort of ethical behavior, good life skills like tenacity and grit, things like compassion and understanding and so forth, and then where does it morph into more political content um, that in a pluralistic society you need to be very careful about having um, uh, in, in the public schools. So I think that's the most important thing. And look, you, I mean, you mentioned Virginia. So I'll just say one, you know, a lot of the stuff that's flared up in Virginia and elsewhere, it's not organized curriculum. It's teachers freelancing because they're not being supported. And so they're being told by their school district to in, make sure that they're talking about equity and equity is not even very clearly defined or make sure that they're talking about challenges of racism in society. Then there's told to go figure that out. And just like airplanes, you don't hear about all the ones that take off and land fine, but you do hear about the ones that don't. And it doesn't take many where teachers cross lines. They may be well-intentioned, but they downloaded something off of Pinterest or whatever it is. 
Um, parents are upset about that. That winds up on social media. And the average parent doesn't know that like that's something that some teacher is freelancing. They just think, well, that's the curriculum. That's what the schools are doing now. And it just raises it raises the temperature. And so not just classroom champions, but lots of these providers across a range of things, teachers just need support uh, and they need to be helped to take on different topics. You don't wake up in the morning knowing how to do this stuff. And we've done a really poor job supporting teachers on this stuff. And in the process, have done a real uh, a real disservice to them. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I think if I can if I can echo what Andy's saying and, and build on that, which is ultimately from the politics side of things, I think Andy mentioned it and touched on it. Look, there's been people in the SEL leadership world who have, uh, I remember, as the you know, as this kind of the social our summer of just, social justice two summers ago happened, where SEL is going to be a Trojan horse for social justice it can't be about, we can't have Trojan horses in education. We can't like first and foremost, period, full stop, you know, whatever it is. Um, yes. Social skills and emotional skills are the basis for understanding each other and working with each other and doing those things. So it, it can, it can support kids and society's views and how we, and how we tackle our, our issues in our, in our, from a social justice standpoint. Yes. But to view SEL as the mechanism, as a Trojan horse that we're going to, there was a time when everybody started just dumping and it's still happening. Everybody's just dumping. If it's not math, science, history, et cetera, it's SEL. That, that's incorrect, including mental health. Um, mental health is a re, is something is, you need reactive, clinical, uh, professional people to support mental health. Look, I have, I, I competed in the Olympic Games with six teammates. Two of them have taken their lives. Uh, I have spoken on this. I have worked with our performance teams at the Olympic Committee on how to how to help athletes from these these standpoints. SEL, we've seen it. We're seeing it in uh, Monroe County Schools that that we support in uh, in Southern Florida, where they have looking at our Mentorship Plus program, which is our higher level of our social emotional learning curriculum, a higher level on top of that, where you actually get matched with an Olympian or a Paralympian for an entire year. And they, they, they communicate with the classrooms or at the schools that they're worked with and they're seeing improvements in mental health, but that's from a proactive SEL standpoint. So you have, I think what we have to really understand is call it SEL, call whatever. We have to have proactive places in schools that we are teaching kids these skills to, co to not just to cope, but to thrive. And, and part of the coping skills are if you understand that people that are Team USA Olympians are dealing with anxiety, but perseverance through it, it makes your own struggles better and easier. Uh, but then we need, we certainly need, and we're, we're doing a better job reacting. You're seeing schools putting in guy, you know, counselors and social workers and other things like that. Not as, not as much as we need, but we're doing a good job reacting to the trauma that our kids have gone through from an evidence-based trauma standpoint, but we're doing a lousy job. Continuing to Andy's point, you have math teachers, science teachers who are trained in those things who are now being quote unquote, you know, made or asked to support the social emotional development of children. They're not, and they're just not equipped. They don't have the, they don't have the tools in place. So I think that that is a, like a big thing that we gotta, we gotta solve. We gotta solve that quick. And it's playing out against a really tough political backdrop. We should just name it, Michael, where like essentially not to, uh, you know, overgeneralize too, too much, but you basically have a situation where you've got some folks on the right, on the far right, who really are snowflakes about this stuff. You mention racism and they fall to pieces. And then you've got some folks on the left who they think a particular political view of the world is so self-evident that it should be taught to every kid. And those things are just colliding in really counterproductive ways. And most people are in the middle. They don't subscribe to either of those viewpoints and they're just getting sort of buffeted along for the ride. And we need more leaders to be willing to, to, to speak up and, and you know, where necessary call BS on both sides so that we can have a more reasoned conversation because the tragedy will be if some of what we're talking about with SEL, some of the things Steve's talking about here, and again, this is broader than just classroom champions, but the folks who are doing this work well, if this kind of gets washed out in a backlash or, you know, um, people like lose trust and, the, you know, that'll be, that'll be really unfortunate because there's a lot of really good, important work. And as you said earlier, Michael, most people, they want their kids to learn these skills. They want them to learn ideas like tenacity and, and, um, uh, you know, and how to, how to solve problems, how to work with others. That's one of the reasons they send them to public schools in the first place. And let's not, let's not forget, reading is a goal. Like learning to read is a goal. There are steps to that. We, we kind of skip over that with kids. We tell them to set a goal 
we tell them to, to set a goal for an A, but then we, we kind of miss and skip over the fundamentals of how a goal works, which is that you will have short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. And oh, by the way, many of your short-term goals won't happen. So how do you adjust and how do you insert perseverance to do that? So, I mean, the data is incredibly clear when you're talking about like double digit percentage increases in academic performance with quality SEL style programs that are in there that are offering solutions and providing these skills to kids. And I think that's the the mind blowing thing for us, right? Which is sometimes we I step back and go, man, how did we have education around this long where we just skipped over a few pretty darn important parts of life? Let alone, let alone learning. And I think there's where the opportunity for people like you to really help get the word out is like, how do we help? And, and, and to Andy's point, uh, we need leaders who are willing to, to be there. And, and I think that's a really hard place considering, you know, the politics around it right now. Well, I, but I love this conversation, the way you've both framed all of this. And I, I guess that gets to the last point. I just want to ask you both on as we wrap up here. It occurs to me we could go for a while. There's a lot of topics, but just focus on that, which is, you know, you mentioned, Steve, how you reach a goal, executive function skills, things of that nature that you're just not born with, it turns out. You you, you need to learn. Um, and so as we talk about resetting the place of sports and participation and building these skills in, in our youth and so forth, and that's, and, and you, you, you all have both, I think, eloquently laid out the goal. As we think about sort of that, that one next step, maybe let's take the sports arena, right, of resetting that in American society and one thing that ought to happen What's that first step in your mind uh, that, that that we ought to be doing? Steve, you want to go first? Nanny, you get last word? Yeah, happy to. Um, what's the first step? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think that? I think first step would be we need to find a we need to find some places of agreement. Uh, it, you know, traditional problem solving one hundred and one, right? Conflict conflict uh, solving one hundred and one. We got to find some agreement. And again, I, I come from a very um, I, I believe in the power of sport. I believe in it in so many ways outside of we go back to the beginning of the conversation, which is what else we all do in here, but trying to enjoy our lives and be healthy and, 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 and pass that on to our kids. Um, given that, so I think coming to a, a place within, I think the schools are a key. Clearly the schools are a key to our society is where all of our children go, go at one point or another for extended periods of time in their life. Um, so I think find a place of agreement. Sport could be one of those places where having sport influence, being, being an influence could be, could be one of those places. And if it is from a sport standpoint, then I, I think we've got to get together. We've got to get our major leagues together. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity there. Our, our, our prof professional and NCAA systems don't quite understand the power they can have in, in turning around our schools. And if they did, and as that's what I'm trying to spend a lot of time, both from Classroom Champions perspective and a personal perspective is, is showing them, look, NBA, NFL, uh, MLS, NHL, MLB, NCAA, NWL, you know, Women's National Women's Soccer League, WNBA, let's get all of you guys together in a room. Let's get the, the 50 state super chief, you know, chief superintendents organization and maybe council of great city schools in a room. And let's talk about how can sport in a system systematic way support the needs of the system. And I think there's a huge opportunity to do that. So Michael, I think those two things, let's come to an agreement and find some, some, and if, you know, find some agreements on how to move forward. If sports, one of those things, there is a giant hunger from the, the leagues, the teams and the, and the players and the athletes to do something meaningful. Uh, and, and I think that's how sport can really make a difference in, in, in that way. Cause that's where we aggregate everybody. Every, you can get, you know, in sport more so than the arts, more so than in music and other places, you have a, you have places where you can get eight people in a room and you can speak for thousands of, of role models that our kids know and, and, and believe in, in a way that is more powerful and more systemic than anywhere else. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I thought that what Steve said. So that I'll just go in a slightly different direction. And you said one thing. I'll, I'll give two. Number one is gender equity in sports. I think like we still have such a long way to go. And, and you were saying, you know, Michael, you've got daughters. You're going to see this as they grow up in ways big and small. How girls' sports are just second class citizens, just across the board in in all kinds of ways, obvious 
in terms of access to facilities and time and weight rooms and in ways subtle in terms of the messages that are sent. And girls sports are great. They're exciting. Um, and we need to build a, a culture like that. And it's, it's exasperating when you go to like high schools where the football team might be mediocre or the men's basketball team and the women's basketball team's great and it's barely supported. And they're actually like doing the winning or the volleyball team or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's a big culture shift where we still have a lot of work to do. And in terms of a more inclusive society is really important. And then the second thing would just be, We've got to have a broader frame on this. We anchor off of elite sports. We love elite sports. Most people, the closest they're ever going to get to elite sports is the stands. And we, we should be more open about that. And that's how you build a culture of kids continuing to play and so forth. And I think, look, I think elite sports are great. They're exciting. Um, but if you want people to sort of just develop a love for sports and so forth, we need to broaden the frame. And if you look at most of our most sort of fractious issues, whether it's toxicity in youth sports or issues around transgender athletes. It's all anchored on these really elite sports when in fact, in a more broad level, these things aren't actually sort of, sort of huge uh, issues. It's always on these places where it becomes zero sum. And we just need a broader frame if we want people to keep moving and so forth and not think sports are something you do until you're not good enough at some level. And then you stop rather than something you do in your life. And as a, as a part of, uh, as a part of your life. Really well said, Steve, Andy. Thanks for helping us unpack this topic and appreciate you all joining us in the future of education. We'll be back next time. Thanks for having us. Thanks. It was great.